Hello and welcome to our historians panel on the Kronstadt uprising of 1921. Today we will hear from four historians on the events leading up to the declaration of the Kronstadt Commune in March 1921, together with its suppression and the aftermath of this tragedy. Now I will introduce our moderator and first speaker. Lara Green is a historian of modern Russia and the Soviet Union with a particular interest in revolutionary movements, political violence, media, and gender histories. She is currently working on an article about the life and death of Peter Kropotkin in Transnational Perspective. Konstantin Tarasov is a research fellow at the St. Petersburg Institute of History within the Russian Ac Academy of Science. He will speak on Kronstadt self-government in 1917. Okay, thank you. Just a moment. Okay, uh, so uh, today we'll speak about the Kronstadt self-government in the 1970s. So let's go on. At first, as I'm a first uh, speaker, I want to introduce this uh, like uh, geography about what we will talk about today. So uh, Kronstadt is uh, the city on the island Kotlin, which is in the Finland Gulf uh, near by uh, St. Petersburg or uh, Petrograd, as it was called during the First World War. And uh, it was uh, quite a small city, but in the same time, it was important because of its Navy base uh, on it. And one of the uh, most important uh, parts of the events during the 1970s. So uh, the other really important uh, like point uh, on this geography is the uh, Yakarne or Ancher Square which hold the main uh, things where political things were going on in the city during the revolution. So uh, it was uh, nearby the, and it is nearby the Naval Cathedral uh, in the city, uh, which also was one of the most important like uh, symbol of this uh, revolutionary uh, period. So uh, as I told you, it was quite a small city about uh, 500,000 citizens uh, and half of them, mostly half of them were workers. Uh, what about the horizon of this naval base? Uh, part of it were soldiers like uh, uh, some artillery soldiers and of course sailors, which also became one of the most important symbol of the revolution, yeah, like sailor with a rifle. So uh, it was not really big and maybe not really important base for all this uh, period of the war, but in the same time, there was uh, different uh, military schools and uh, some uh, ships uh, which uh, was used during the revolution. So uh, if we will uh, uh, go to February uprising in 1917, we have to know what was going on on the city. So, because uh, uh, Kronstadt was known as uh, the um, base with really strict discipline, and the symbol of uh, this discipline was Admiral Deren. Yeah, he was the military governor of the Kronstadt. So, uh, this uh, discipline was uh, really strict and in the whole army we can see, but in the same time, it was much more rude uh, in the crunch at that time. Yeah, some of the restrictions were even against the human dignity. For example, a really uh, famous sign was near the main part of the crunch Dogs are not allowed and to prohibited for uh, lower ranks. Yeah, lower ranks, this means soldiers and sailors. So we can understand it was uh, a horrible situation with the people, even with only one this side. Yeah, so uh, sailors hated uh, Admiral Deren, as we know, in, uh, with the, their memoirs. And uh, that's why he was one of the first victim of the uprising, which happened in February. So uh, the whole advance during this period was connected with the Petrograd, as uh, we can understand, because uh, uh, when the news about the revolution in the Petrograd uh, went to Kronstadt, uh, sailors and the soldiers organized their own uprising against uh, military administration. So uh, they arrested uh, Admiral Biren and uh, he was executed on the Encher Square uh, near the uh, Naval Cathedral. So uh, this place, Encher Square or Yakarne Square, became the uh, like place for execution of all the officers uh, in uh, Kronstadt. Uh, most of them uh, which were killed were really strict to their soldiers and that's why it was the causes of 
uh, this uh, horrible and bloody event. So about uh, 500 of the, um, these officers were arrested during the February Revolution. Uh, but if we are uh, speaking about the whole uprising and about the, um, uh, like fighting against police and uh, some of the uh, officers who were, which were against the revolution, uh, there would be a really, uh, uh, not really lots of uh, people uh, were killed during this time. So after the February Revolution, there was a big funeral uh, of uh, the victims of the revolution, and there was only seven coffins uh, during this time. You could see this uh, funeral uh, in the Naval Cathedral uh, after the revolution. So uh, it was much more bloody for uh, officers during that time, and mostly because of this uh, like horrible discipline uh, organized in the uh, Grandstadt. Uh, February uprising also was uh, the moment of the self-organization. Yeah, so the first days of that uh, was uh, created the movement committee. Uh, it was created uh, on the Yakovina Square. Uh, the people elected there were uh, more or less random. Uh, most of them uh, didn't take part in the whole revolution during the whole the uh, 1970. But it was uh, the, one of the first uh, institution of uh, self-government during uh, this time. So uh, this movement committee, as it was called, organized the delegates meeting. Uh, this was the, also some kind of an institution where a representative of the whole uh, factories and the whole uh, military units were presented. So uh, only in the 3rd of March, uh, provisional government sent uh, its own commissar uh, to Kronstadt and it was people you could see uh, him on the slide. So uh, the, uh, provisional government wants to uh, stop the bloody events in February with the help of the commissar and to organize the new power uh, uh, during the revolution. Uh, but in the same time, uh, we could see how Pipilaev lo lost all his power during like the first weeks of the revolution. So at first, uh, he was uh, he got really a big authority uh, in the Kronstadt because uh, he was the uh, representative of the revolutionary government. And he also uh, organized the project of the city executive committee connected uh, to the Soviet of military uh, deputies. Yeah, so from the like, uh, Kronstadt Garrison, uh, Soviet of workers uh, deputies, and uh, this uh, so-called city group. Yeah, so representative of the like citizens of the Kronstadt. But uh, up to the week he spent in the Kronstadt, he went to Petrograd uh, to report <clears throat> to provisional government and uh, to the Petrograd Soviet what is going on in at um, Kronstadt that time. So during this week, he was in Petrograd, he lost all his power because uh, two Soviets, uh, which were already organized, military deputies and the Soviet of workers uh, deputies organized the new Kronstadt Soviet. And uh, they refused to, uh, to uh, connect with the city group, with the citizens which were uh, believed as a bourgeoisie or some kind of the, like contra-revolutionary elements. So uh, that's why the city group representatives of the like uh, um, citizen people uh, joined city Duma, uh, which was uh, re-elected during that time. Yeah, so uh, it was the first period which uh, established the Soviet power itself, and in the same time existence of the uh, city Duma, like municipal uh, organization, uh, which also wanted to take part in a uh, revolution. So the main uh, members and the leaders of the Kronstadt Soviets uh, became uh, Lubovich, uh, a Bolshevik, and uh, Ram, uh, Lamana, who at that time was a non-party uh, representative. And uh, soon he joined the party of uh, socialist Maximilitz. Uh, and uh, it would be follows told the story about the parties and the political movements of the Soviet during that time. So uh, you could see the main uh, parties uh, which were elected in the first Soviet. Yeah, so Bolsheviks, uh, the left wing of socialist revolutionaries, so the like peasant party, as it called itself, uh, Mensheviks, anarchists, and non-party party, as we could see, uh, say, 
because uh, it was a really uh, important organization uh, before it became the party. Yeah, so only in the autumn of 1917, they organized uh, the party of uh, socialist revolutionaries, maximalists. Yeah, so uh, that time they were blamed uh, for their non-party uh, position, and that's why they organized the, uh, the party. So it was the moment of uh, politicization of the Soviet. Well, one of the most important uh, blocks you know, which were created in the Soviet were the block of Bolsheviks and left uh, socialist revolutionaries. Uh, mostly uh, those two parties uh, uh, play a biggest role during all the 1970s. So, but uh, we could see that even those uh, first weeks of the revolution, uh, the Kronstadt Soviet established its power uh, not connected with the provisional commissars. So it was based on the uh, elected uh, regiment and uh, ship committees. Yeah, and um, also it made uh, those uh, regiments to elect uh, unit commanders. And uh, it also created the uh, militia which, uh, which have to organize the security uh, in the city during the period of pogroms, of uh, like uh, robbery and so on. And uh, also it was the part of the uh, power uh, investigative commission, which had to investigate uh, the role of the officers which were arrested during the uh, February uprising in the Kronstadt. So uh, these officers, like 500 of them, uh, spent in the jail for like, uh, uh, half a year and uh, provisional government make a lot of uh, you know, things to uh, make them free. Yeah, but and uh, it was like a long story. Uh, uh, what about the Com control commission? It's also one of the most important part of the uh, Soviet power uh, during that uh, short part because uh, it wants to establish its own way to control all of the factories of the main uh, points in the city. And of course, uh, the other way of uh, ruling, it's a newspaper which was established and it was called uh, Izvesti. So, but it was not the main part of the power during the February Revolution. Uh, and uh, you could see on the, flight, uh, on the slide the quote from the memoirs of uh, provisional government commissar uh, Stankiewicz. If Bakunin rose from his uh, grave uh, in May 1917, he would have to admit that his uh, ideal was re uh, released in the Kronstadt. Yes, uh, uh, he believed uh, that uh, all the power was in the hands, not in the hands of the Soviet, as uh, Soviet want to show, but in the hand of this uh, meeting on the Anxious Square. Like thousands and thousands of people came there and speak. Yes, yeah, so uh, they didn't uh, have an opportunity to speak during all this time. And it was one of the most important uh, moment for them to um, uh, say about all the things they want. So uh, the orators of this meeting became uh, one of the most important people in the Kronstadt and even in the whole Russia. Yeah, the first one, it's uh, Rashal. He was a Bolshevik and he was really careful orator. And that's why he was more or less popular. Uh, Brushwit, who was a socialist revolutionary uh, with the big bird, uh, he uh, pretended uh, to be a, uh, a peasant. Yeah, so socialist revolution is a peasant war. Yeah, so that's why some of the sailors and um, uh, soldiers uh, who were like peasants in their, like normal life uh, supported him. Yurchuk and Blechman, uh, also really famous orators, uh, both were uh, anarchists. The first one, anarchist uh, syndicalist, the second one, anarchist communist. Yes, like two branches of the anarchist uh, group uh, created in the first week. Yeah, both were really radical in the, this time, and uh, only Yurchuk uh, supported some of the uh, Bolsheviks' uh, organizations and um, like events during that time. Blechman, uh, in the same time, he was much more radical, and sometimes he was like a funny a person uh, to show how uh, the most radical uh, way of revolution could be. Yeah, and it's also uh, made him really popular at that time. 
like uh, briefly about the whole uh, story about the 1917 and the Kronstadt. It's a story about the Kronstadt Republic. Uh, mostly it was connected with the uh, struggle for power between Soviet and the Commissar of Provisional Government. So uh, as uh, I mentioned, uh, Pipilev, the Commissar of Provisional Government, lost all his powers in the first week of the revolution, but uh, he wanted to play a big role. Yeah, so that's why in May there was a uh, resolution uh, connected with the, uh, uh, the leader of the city militia. So uh, commissar of provisional government wanted to choose his own person, and so it said that uh, it's uh, not uh, his competence to, uh, to make such a decision. So that's why the resolution of the Soviet was that Soviet is the only authority in the Kronstadt. So there was a, like a big scandal in the newspapers that time that the Kronstadt organized its own republic. It wanted to separate from the whole Russia and so on. It was not true, but uh, it's uh, how Kronstadt became so popular. And uh, different peasants, soldiers, sailors, like uh, workers came to Kronstadt to see how it looked like the republic which ruled by the Soviet its own. Yeah, so uh, in uh, uh, Petrograd this time, uh, the uh, provisional government with the help of socialists want to organize some negotiations with the Kronstadt because it's really close to Petrograd and uh, when uh, only power and it's not a provisional government, but a Soviet it was dangerous as a provisional government. But, so uh, socialists uh, came to Kronstadt, uh, such socialists as uh, Chidze and Skobolev, and uh, they started the negotiations with the Soviet. So uh, the decision of these negotiations was elected commissar. So uh, there was no, uh, from this time, the uh, representative of the provisional government on the Kronstadt Island. So uh, after it, uh, uh, most of the events connected with the July days, when uh, it was the first uh, decision to take hold the power to the Soviets made by uh, Petrograd Gorizon. So Kronstadt uh, sailors joined these uh, huge demonstrations and the uh, uh, fight on the streets during these uh, three days. Yeah, uh, uh, the third, fourth, and the fifth of July. So for a Kronstadt, uh, the end of July days was the uh, uh, like army defeat, like war defeat, but not uh, like ideological defeat. So they wanted to uh, join the anti-government movement again. And uh, that's why there was another well, a big uh, story about the so second uh, commissar crisis when uh, Soviet pulled away the commissar they elected and even they got an opportunity to uh, resignation of the commissar. So much more power uh, during that time. So even uh, City Duma uh, tried to play the role during that time, tried to take the uh, part of the power at that time. Uh, Ranschat Soviet refused to uh, make any negotiations with them. So the last uh, part of the whole this story uh, that uh, Kronstadt uh, played uh, in the Russian Revolution was uh, that uh, some ships from the Kronstadt joined the October up upheaval and uh, even they take, uh, took part in the storming of Winter Palace uh, during uh, that period. So uh, we can see that uh, Kronstadt uh, and uh, the Enche Square Yes, yeah, so, uh, on this Kotlin Island played a, a great role. Yeah, and uh, we could see some kind of the direct democracy which was established during this short period. Yeah, so uh, my colleagues will speak mostly about the civil war uh, and the role of the Kronstadt. But I think it's really important to understand uh, how it became so uh, important part of the revolution. So to end up with uh, my presentation, I want to show some uh, really important books, maybe it would be interesting for the audience. Uh, so at first it's uh, sources and uh, mostly mem memoirs. Uh, some of them uh, um, translated into English. So it's uh, first uh, memoirs of the anarchist Yurchuk, uh, Kronstadt and the Russian Revolution. Uh, and uh, Bolshevik Raskolnikov, Kronstadt and Petrograd in 1970, yeah, which, has, uh, which I highly recommend 
for you to read. And also, unfortunately, uh, only in Russian, it's the uh, uh, mutinous of the Kronstadt Soviets, its own uh, really important uh, issues, uh, like two volumes of them, which uh, somebody who could read Russian, uh, I highly recommend it also. And a little bit about the historiography of the uh, Kronstadt in 1917, like uh, some of uh, historians from the Soviet time, it's uh, Petrash, Mariki uh, Baltisko Flot of Barbie the Pabed of Tibria, yeah, like uh, sailors of the Baltic fleet in the struggle for uh, victory of October. Uh, Hessin, October Revolution and Flot, October Revolution and the Fleet. And two really important uh, English uh, books, uh, even mostly Norman Soul and Israel Gessler. So uh, you could see that's quite old books, but I think it's like one of the uh, best which was written about this uh, period. So if you were interested in, in the uh, period uh, of 1917 in the Kronstadt and uh, prehistory of uh, uh, Kronstadt mutiny, you could uh, read this book, which again, I could say I could highly recommend it. So that's it, thank you. We'll move swiftly on to our second speaker. Um, so if Constantine, you want to stop sharing your screen and, and then we'll switch over to our second speaker. So um, Simon Barani is a historian and author of numerous books and articles, far too many to mention here, but including one that might be of interest to you um, is The Russian Revolution in Retreat, Soviet Workers and the New Communist Elite, 1920 to 24, which was published in 2008. So over to you, Simon. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Lara. Thank you to the organizers uh, for inviting me. I'm going to speak about Kronstadt as part of a wider wave of revolts against the Bolshevik government in 1921, particularly by industrial workers. Just before I start, let me say a bit about what led me to research this subject. I first visited Russia in 1990, the year before the Soviet Union broke up, to find out more about the working class protests that had erupted then, the biggest protest since the 1920s. I was active in the labor movement in the UK and a member of a Trotskyist group. We'd always been inspired by uh, struggles by workers in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, but connecting with them across a divided Europe had been difficult, sometimes impossible. And in the late 80s, that began to change. Coming into contact with Russian and Ukrainian socialists and workers forced me to rethink what I thought I knew about the Russian Revolution. And I soon realized that the version of it told uh, by the Trotskyists that things were going in the right direction until Stalin took over in the mid 20s was simplistic and wrong. And I decided to research the early 20s. And in the early 2000s, I worked in the archives reading minutes of factory meetings, secret police reports, workers' memoirs and other documents. And I use that material in the book that uh, Lara kindly mentioned, and I'll use it in what I say now. I'll talk about the background, then a bit about the workers' movement, and then suggest some conclusions. So background. The Bolsheviks having taken power in October 1917 on that wave of struggles that uh, Constantine talked about, were within months fighting the civil war against the whites. By 1920, the whites had largely been defeated and people were beginning to think about what sort of society might now take shape. And there was a strong strand of Bolshevik opinion that the military and compulsive methods that won the civil war should continue. This thinking was behind the failed attempt in mid-1920 to spread the revolution westwards to Poland by armed force. And that same thinking also underpinned the continuation of compulsory requisitioning of grain from peasants in order to feed urban populations. And this policy led to a large number of very well supported and very violent peasant revolts. By the winter of 1920 to 21, this unsustainable food supply policy combined with the breakdown of the transport system brought a threat of hunger. And this in turn exacerbated discontent among urban workers who were supposed to be the government's main support base, and to a wave of strikes by those workers in February 1921. And just before going on, let's make a point about workers and peasants. Townspeople were a small minority, less than one-fifth of the 
total Russian population. Many workers were first or second generation migrants from the countryside. They retained close links with their villages and could return to them when food was short. And they did that in large numbers during the Civil War. The Bolsheviks were fond of denouncing workers who disagreed with them as having a petty bourgeois peasant mentality. But in reality, most workers, whether pro or anti-Bolshevik, were close to the countryside one way or another. So the workers' movement. In Russia's two largest industrial cities, Moscow and Petrograd, protests against the government gathered momentum during January and February of 1921 with mass meetings and strikes. In Moscow, the state printing works workforce, almost all women, stopped work and marched through the surrounding district, urging other workplaces to join them, which they did. But the strike wave lasted only a couple of days, longer in Petrograd, about a week. But by the time the Kronstadt revolt started on the 1st of March, these workers were back at work. There were then further strikes uh, in the textile uh, mills surrounding Moscow, for example, there was a general strike in Saratov from the 4th of March. Industrial workers sympathized with the Kronstadt uh, sailors and protested against the repression of the revolt. But there was no co coordination between the sailors and workers' movements. They were picked off one after the other. Let me say something about the demands of the workers' movement, which were both economic and political. Many of the economic demands were aimed at dismantling this system of compulsion that had been put in place during the Civil War. There was a big demand for free movement of labor in the Petrograd factories. Times were desperate and workers adopted individual survival strategies. And apart from returning to villages, they might steal products from work to trade or stay off work. And that the big Nevsky factory complex in Moscow, for example, a mass meeting passed a resolution specifically warning managers not to discipline workers for absenteeism. Factory meetings also demanded an end to compulsory requisition, uh, requisitioning of grain and demanded that townspeople be allowed to travel to the countryside to trade with peasants to get that grain. And in February, this demand uh, not only for an uh, end to the grain requisitioning, but also for it to be replaced by a tax in kind was adopted by a big delegate meeting of all the metal workers in Moscow. And a month later, the government adopted exactly the same policy. This marked the end of so-called war communism and the start of the new economic policy. And at that point, really, the Bolsheviks made these concessions uh, on the economic demands, but doubled down on political uh, repression. The most popular of ec economic demand, which was mentioned in the opening of the uh, conference, it was also taken up at Kronstadt, was for the equalization of rations. All prime necessities were being rationed in towns and anyone in any official position, government or Bolshevik party job, factory manager, found corrupt ways to get more rations. And this demand for equal rations was clearly aimed against the state bureaucracy that was taking shape. Political demands were also made against the embryonic bureaucracy, against the trend towards one party uh, dictatorship. Workplace meetings called for freedom of speech. If worker activists were arrested, their workmates very often downed tools to demand their release. Another common political demand, which we also heard in the introduction, was for new elections to the Soviets, which had been active forums for not only de debate, but action in 1917, but had very often stopped functioning uh, during the Civil War. And you heard in the introduction how those demands were made more detailed and articulated uh, at Kronstadt during uh, the rebellion. And there was also widespread unease at the growth of bureaucracy among rank and file members of the Bolshevik party, which was not homogeneous in the way that it would later become. And there were a range of opposition factions, the most well-known, the workers' opposition and democratic centralists, but also a range of locally organized groups, a coalition of which came very close to actually taking the majority in the Moscow uh, Bolshevik party in 1920. And at the 10th party Congress, which took place at the same time as the Kronstadt rebellion, um, as I said, economic concessions and political doubling down. And within the party, uh, these factions uh, were banned. Just a few words about the workers' movement after Kronstadt. While the Kronstadt uh, rebels were suppressed with executions and arrests, the government 
quite consciously tried to limit the repression uh, of factory workers in order not to exacerbate uh, the very uh, the, the, the widespread uh, dissension uh, in the country. Um, this approach involved destroying any meaningful prospect of Soviet democracy. Um, so while the non-Bolshevik socialist parties, such as the left socialist revolutionaries and anarchists, faced repression, many workers organized non-party groupings, exactly along the lines that Konstantin mentioned with respect to Kronstadt in 1917. And in Moscow in 1921, uh, the demand for new Soviet elections was partly uh, conceded in May 1921. Many of the opposition groups, even people who'd recently left the Bolshevik party, were subject to repression. But the non-partyists stood against the Bolsheviks in all the big factories in Moscow and won uh, in almost every case uh, and were the majority representing uh, the big factories. Uh, only because all the government offices uh, sent Bolshevik delegates to the Soviet did that ensure the Bolsheviks kept the majority. And it took several more years for these islands of independent working class political activity uh, to be smothered. Okay, so uh, conclusions. First, the Kronstadt revolt was not an isolated event. Uh, the sailors' demands, including for a return for Soviet democracy, were similar to demands raised uh, by factory workers. Second, although the Bolsheviks believed that their government was at risk and some of their counter-revolutionary white enemies also thought so, we can see as historians with the benefit of hindsight that that risk was not that great. The workers' struggles were not coordinated with the sailors' revolt, but also a lot of these workers were essentially seeking the reform uh, of the uh, Soviet system rather than the uh, overthrow. So although the movement was in many respects revolutionary, uh, I'm skeptical about labeling it a third revolution. That, that's something that's happened uh, in the 20th century, but I think we can, we can rethink uh, what does that really mean. Third and final conclusion, the conditions for building any kind of socialist society in Russia in 1921 were really bad. The economy had collapsed following the war, uh, the revolution, had not spread to Germany and to other industrialized countries in the way that revolutionaries had all hoped. Nevertheless, despite that, and in those terrible conditions, workers and sailors fought for a restoration and development of Soviet democracy after the Civil War, and that is something from which we can take enormous inspiration. This fight could have strengthened uh, the fight against the hierarchical and exploitative trends in Soviet society that were already visible in the state bureaucracy and in the Bolsheviks dictatorial actions. But rather than uh, restoring Soviet democracy and working together with those forces, the Bolsheviks opted to suppress the sailors revolt physically and to bully cynically workers who protested. And this was deeply, perhaps fatally damaging to uh, the revolutionary project and the ideological legacy it left. This idea that authoritarian repressive actions are somehow inevitable or justifiable in revolutions, that legacy damaged socialism throughout the 20th century. And in, in this sense, Kronstadt was a really tragic uh, turning point. Uh, and I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon, for another really fantastic paper there. So um, what we'll do is we'll hand over to our third speaker. So our third speaker is Dmitry Ivanov, um, who's a historian of revolutionary Russia, of anarchist political activism and of popular politics. He's currently working with colleagues on an edited collection of anarchist texts of the Russian Revolution, which I believe he's going to tell us a little bit about in his talk. Um, and his recent articles include a really interesting piece on Emma Goldman. So over to you, um, Dimitri, and I will try and keep up with changing the slides for you. Uh, very good. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, as um, uh, Lara had kindly mentioned, uh, uh, my name is Dmitry Ivano Ivanov, uh, and in addition to writing dissertation on the events of uh, Russian Revolution and Civil War, I'm also working on uh, the history of anarchist participation in these events. And uh, one of the side effects of these activities is that I found myself assisting in the editing of a uh, compilation of anarchist and uh, left communist writings on the Kronstadt Rebellion. Uh, it includes uh, Russian translations of pamphlets and articles uh, by Alexander Berkman, 
uh, Emma Goldman, uh, Ida Met, and a few others. Uh, for most of the people in the far left movement uh, in the collective West, uh, the Kronstadt events are strongly associated uh, with anarchism, um, and but and the symbolic heritage of Kronstadt uh, was appropriated. Uh, by anarchists uh, to a large uh, extent. I did a search in the International Institute of Social History uh, catalogues, uh, which is in Amsterdam, and there was uh, the Gruppo Kronstadt in Italy, uh, Gruppo Anarchiste Kronstadt uh, in Paris, Actions Comité Kronstadt, Kronstadt in West Berlin, uh, there was a Kronstadt newspaper in uh, Valencia, there was a Kronstadt Collective uh, uh, in the Netherlands, and so on. Uh, this does not quite correspond to the emphatically non-party moods of the rebels, which uh, Simon and uh, uh, Konstantin Andreevich have mentioned. Um, anarchists uh, like Sergei Vershinin or Vasily Yakovenko were represented amongst rebel leaders, rebellion leaders. Uh, anarchists fought against uh, the commissars with weapons, and they spread leaflets uh, in Petrograd uh, factories calling for support of the rebellion, but uh, the same can also be said about left socialist revolutionaries, about Mensheviks, about former communists, and so on. Uh, the Kronstadters have revived the spirit of non-party Soviet revolutionarism of 1917 that uh, Konstantin uh, sp spoke about earlier, which was born out of the experience of political struggle under Tsarism and which received widespread support as the institutions of political democracy uh, like the Constituent Assembly um, collapsed. Uh, one of uh, Kronstadt's uh, chief slogans, power to the Soviets uh, and not to the parties, uh, was formulated by the Union of Socialist Revolutionary Maximalists uh, back in 1919. Um, Konstantin has uh, mentioned uh, this group, uh, which was uh, strongly represented uh, in Kronstadt specifically. Uh, some of the most influential texts that interpreted the events of uh, 1921 like uh, the Truth About Kronstadt book, which, if I understand correctly, is available to read on this conference's website in English, uh, were published by the Socialist Revolutionary Party Press. Uh, but uh, neo-populists, uh, like uh, socialist revolutionaries and uh, maximalists, uh, who seem to have maintained strongest links to the rebel refugees, uh, failed to monopolize uh, the Kronstadt rebellion in the view of uh, international revolutionary movement, uh, due to their organizational uh, weakness. Uh, the Menshevik Social Democrats, who were also represented amongst uh, rebel leaders and who issued uh, their own leaflets in Petrograd uh, that called for support of Kronstadt, um, did not see the rebellion as their own. And by the most part, uh, they did not use its slogans in the political struggle. Uh, it was uh, the anarchists who made uh, political use of uh, the Kronstadt experience. Uh, in 1922, 1923, one of the most uh, respected uh, international anarchist leaders, Alexander Berkman, and uh, one of the founders of the Russian anarchist uh, movement and a popular Kronstadt leader in 1917, also mentioned uh, by Konstantin uh, uh, Yefim Yerchuk, uh, they published uh, their own accounts of the rebellion. And uh, these books have made a significant impact on the perception of the 1921 events in uh, Western Europe and in North America. Since then, uh, Berkman's pamphlet uh, was translated into German, Lithuanian, Spanish, Dutch, and French, and Yerchuk's into French, Spanish, Bulgarian, and English. Uh, by that time, uh, by the early 20s, the split in the far left sector of the international workers' movement between supporters and opponents of collaboration with communists uh, was growing. In the letter of January 16, uh, 1922, to Vyacheslav uh, Molotov, uh, Leon Trotsky acknowledged that, uh, quote, agitation resulting from uh, our repressions against anarchists and Menshevik is on a large scale. Just then, in January 1922, Alexander Berkman and Emma Goldman uh, started their own campaign of denunciation of communist terror against dissidents. Um, the Bolsheviks uh, have tried to use uh, so-called Soviet anarchist syndicalists and former anarchists who joined the, the Communist Party to declare that the anarchist uh, syndicalist movement had split into supporters and uh, opponents of the Soviet uh, Russia. Um, but by then, many of the previously firmly Soviet anarchists, including Yarchuk and Berkman themselves, uh, gave up hope of collaborating 
uh, with uh, the communists. Uh, the moment of disillusionment uh, is captured in an excerpt from uh, Berkman's Russian diary, which uh, is included in our forthcoming collection. And it was already published uh, in English by Blackhead Press in Canada. Uh, this disillusionment uh, was caused by a clash between a smokescreen of the one party state's information policies and uh, realities of political struggle. Uh, even Berkman, who was intimately acquainted with uh, top Petrograd leaders, living more or less next door to Zinoviev uh, in uh, February 1921, uh, he had no clear idea of what was happening in Kronstadt and what were the rebels' demands. Uh, retrospective analysis of the events has to account for, amongst other factors, uh, the limited information that was available and uh, the censorship factor. Uh, a realization of uh, deceit and betrayal that were covering, uh, covering up uh, the reality of abuse and violence has pushed Berkman and many of his comrades away from the communists. Anarcha syndicalist alignment with the communist international was halted with the setting up of uh, uh, the International Working Men's Association in 1922. Uh, one of the many causes thereof was Berkman and Goldman's campaign. Uh, they used uh, the suppression of Kronstadt uh, uprising of 1921 as uh, an example of cruelty and hypocrisy of the communists uh, and of their betrayal of uh, the ideals of the 1917 revolution. Uh, perhaps uh, the limited information available to the sailors was one of the causes of the rebellion itself, uh, which was also the case uh, during the February revolution on the Baltic fleet when uh, admirals who were trying to suppress information about uprising in Petrograd uh, uh, were uh, the first to be, uh, to be killed. Um, uh, the ex-chairman of the Provisional Revolutionary Committee, Stepan Petrushenko, suggested uh, that uh, uh, despite only being some 30 miles um, away from Petrograd, the Kronstadters became aware of strikes in the city only with some uh, delay. Uh, he noted that, quote, uh, the purpose of uh, the dictatorship of proletariat is for proletariat to know nothing, end of quote. That led the sailors to send delegations to tour striking factories and the sudden uh, realization of the helplessness of uh, the workers uh, drove them to rage. As we know, it was these delegations that addressed the March uh, the first 21 rally in the Anchor Square, which had uh, started uh, the rebellion as an open uh, movement. Uh, when he was exiled in Finland, uh, Petrichenko pledged to submit the lessons of 1921, quote, to the trial of international proletariat and laboring peasantry with all the details. Uh, that did happen, uh, but a little later when the issues of interrelations between various uh, revolutionary groups uh, gained new currency because of the civil war in Spain. In uh, 1938, Trotsky did not have uh, Soviet anarcho-syndicalists his, at his disposal, so he had to write a hue and cry over Kronstadt uh, himself. Uh, that also brought uh, Victor Serge uh, into the discussion and uh, he expressed some criticism of the treatment of the Kronstadters that he did not make public uh, back in the day. Uh, Ida Metz's influential account of the Kronstadt Commune uh, was also uh, born out of uh, the 1938 discussion, although it was only published in 1949 and it used a wider source base uh, than any of the studies hitherto uh, published outside of the USSR. As Trotsky's supporter John G. Wright correctly noted, uh, Berkman's pamphlet, uh, The Truth, uh, used uh, the truth about uh, Kronstadt uh, book as its single biggest source. Berkman's own diary is the source of uh, his description of the Petrograd Soviet session on March the 4th, uh, 1921. There, there are some other bits and pieces that he utilized, but much of what is present in uh, Berkman's uh, uh, as Berkman's diary in uh, his book, The Bolshevik Myth, was uh, just using diary as a literary device, as Nicholas Walter had noted uh, when he uh, looked at the original manuscript in the Amsterdam archive. Um, Matt uh, has made good use of the emigre periodicals, but much of the material that she introduced in her Kronstadt Commune uh, book came from a 1931 book by Alexei Puchov, um, uh, Kronstadt Rebelle, uh, Kronstadt Mutiny. Uh, she, re she describes him as a Stalinist official historian, quite correctly. Uh, he served as a Navy commissar um, 
as uh, the picture here shows, uh, including during the siege of Leningrad. Shortly before that, in 1941, he defended his dissertation on the suppression of the counter-revolutionary Kronstadt mutiny of 1921. Over the years, uh, Med's book was translated into English, Spanish, Italian, German, Japanese, Turkish, and Swedish. But I would note that some of its success is due to her ability to work with biased and hostile sources and to professional work of Puchov, uh, who probably wouldn't want it to, to be put to such use, but you know, uh, once the word is out. Uh, although he obviously followed the correct ideological line, uh, he was more honest than the communist leaders were in 1921. I'd also have to know that uh, the first publication of an anarchist leaflet that circulated in Petrograd during the uh, Kronstadt events, uh, where there is power, there is no freedom, uh, shown on the screen here, uh, was made in 1931 in an official party History Institute uh, publication. In his diary of for March uh, the 10th, uh, Berkman wrote, quote, one anarchist leaflet is circulating I think its contents foolish. It may lead to a pricing in city that can bring only chaos and a code. Obviously, he kept that sentiment to himself and did not mention uh, his misgivings in his Xbox post facto writings. Uh, even historians uh, sympathetic to anarchism could reveal undesirable, unwelcome truth uh, as a preface to the 1977 uh, French edition of Ida Met's book on the Kronstadt Commune noted it was good that she didn't leave until the publication in French of uh, Paul Average's uh, book uh, Kronstadt 1921 because it contained evidence of uh, Stepan Petrychenko's cooperation with uh, the monarchist general uh, Petr Wrangel. So uh, I hope I didn't hurt anyone's love of truth uh, more than was absolutely necessary, and at least some of it was interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you for another really fa a really fascinating talk there. So we'll move on to our final speaker, last but not least, and certainly not least in the number of works that he's published on the history of um, Russian revolutionary thought. Uh, Alexei Gusev is a historian of political ideas and movements in modern and contemporary Russia. Um, and among his recent works, so I just had to pick a few out of many, um, he's published articles on uh, the armed conflict and civil war, opposition to Stalinism and elections to the Moscow Soviet in the early Soviet era. So over to you, Alexei. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, the nature of the Kronstadt Uprising of 1921 was defined by its participants as the beginning of the Third Revolution in Russia. Uh, the First Revolution of February 1917 overthrew Tsarism, rule of landowners and uh, imperial officialdom. The Second Revolution in October 1917 put an end to the rule of bourgeoisie and the Third Revolution had to overthrow what uh, Kronstadters uh, called Bolshevik um, uh, commissarocracy, uh, the rule of commissar, the rule of communist bureaucracy, and thus finally liberate uh, toiling masks. Uh, as a program declaration of the Kronstadt Revolutionary Committee, uh, what we fight for of uh, March 8, 1921 said, this revolution, I quote, should have international significance. It will rouse workers of the West and East and open the road to the authentic socialism. At first glance, uh, such declaration may look naive, one naval base pretending to start a new revolution. But seen in concrete historical contents, context, it deserves a more serious attitude. Uh, if we understand the revolution as a process of radical social transformations developing under influence of mass popular movements and uh, involving changes of political regimes, then events in Russia from February 1917 to 1922 constitute the great Russian revolution, similar to the great French revolution or the 18th century, which also lasted for several years. And uh, this great Russian revolution cons consisted of several phases. It was conditioned and caused by an objective need to resolve a number of key problems and contradictions of the uh, social modernization in Russia. 
mainly two most important problems, the land question to give land to peasants and the political question to give political power, rights and freedoms to people. In other words, land and freedom as uh, the, the popular slogan of the revolution formulated. And this revolution, including con confrontation of various social and political forces in civil war, continued till stabilization of the new Bolshevik political regime on the basis of partial resolution of the land question and secession of the mass popular struggles. In this process of the Great Russian Revolution, we can define several main phases. The first phase is February, March, 1917. Uh, this revolution of the through Tsarism by did not um, uh, did not solve a neighbor uh, uh, land question nor uh, uh, a political question. The second phase, October Revolution of 1917, it formally gave land to peasants, but very soon Bolsheviks or communists uh, established system of war communism which Simon described and uh, under which the state confiscated agricultural production and peasants and workers were put under strict bureaucratic rule. In place of proclaimed Soviet power came communist party authoritarian dictatorship. Uh, key questions of the great Russian revolution remained unresolved also at the third phase of the great Russian revolution, the phase of large scale front civil war confrontation. And uh, th this led to the fourth phase uh, of the uh, Great Russian Revolution. This period of the new revolutionary upsurge lasted from the end of 1920 to summer of 1921. And one of the most important events of this period became the Kronstadt uprising in March 1921. It should be seen in the closest relation with other events of this phase. First, the winter of 1920-21 marked the highest point of the peasant war in Russia. Mass peasant uprising engulfed all grain producing regions. In spring 1921, uh, 165 large insurgent detachments with more than 100,000 fighters operated in the country. Most of the countryside territory went out of control of the Moscow government. Secondly, there was an upsurge of the workers' protest movement everywhere. All main industrial centers of Russia, workers went on strikes and part, substantial part of these strikes involved political demands. And it was the February 1921 strike wave in both Moscow and Petersburg that directly provoked the Kronstadt uprising. Sure, a whole series of protest action, including rebellions, took place in the Red Army, like in Volga region, the mutiny of uh, commander of division Sapashkov, uh, in Ukraine, the commander of the cavalry brigade Maslakov, and so on and so forth. Looking from the standpoint of the political theory, this situation of the early 1921 could be described as a revolutionary situation. Uh, this notion of revolutionary situation is known mostly in the interpretation of Vladimir Lenin, but Lenin himself apparently borrowed this notion from writings of liberal French historians of the 19th century, Thiers and Minier, and Alex de Tocqueville also used this, this notion. Lenin defined the revolutionary situation as a situation of general crisis, when I quote, the suffering and want of the masses have grown more acute than usual, and they considerably increase their activity. In other words of Lenin, the lower classes don't want to live in the old way. This feature was definitely present in 1921. Modern theories of revolutions, uh, revolutionary situations developed by such authors as Charles Tilly, Olivier Filiul, Michael Dobry, and others, concretize this property of the revolutionary situation in the following way. First, active protests involve a significant percentage of population. Large inter-class coalitions are formed, which lead to the spread of the protest movement and um, 
in our case, it was an objectively formed coalition between peasants, workers, and part of the armed forces. And the universalization of basic demands of protesting masses. In 1921, protesting masses demanded three, three freedoms. Freedom of labor, freedom of trade, and political freedom. Uh, mostly in the form of the free elected Soviets, but also in some cases there were slogans and demands for um, the restoration of full political democracy and uh, constituent assembly. Uh, the next property of a revolutionary situation is the crisis in the ruling elite. In Lenin words, uh, the upper classes should be unable to rule in the old way. In the language of contemporary political science, it, it is divisions within the central bodies of the state, divisions or defections within security forces. And we also see this feature in 1921. In the ruling, ruling Bolshevik party at that time experienced a profound crisis, both of the, at the leadership and rank and file level. Party, party leaders and activists grew conscious of the fact that policy of war communism has led to a dead end and generated crisis in all spheres. Attempts to find a way out of crisis led to the bitter discussion on trade unions that divided even Central Committee and Politburo of the Communist Party into rival factions. And the factional struggles engulfed also Communist Party organization in the Baltic fleet. Uh, Petrograd party leaders around Zinovi and fleet's commissar Kuzmin uh, fought Raskolnikov, who was a um, commander of the fleet and belonged to Trotsky faction. And finally, they forced Raskolnikov to resign. Uh, this struggle in the tops of party uh, led to um, party leaders losing credibility among communist sailors. And there were talks about even creation of the new opposition called the fleet opposition. The influence of fleet uh, Communist Party sales were falling. Sailors were leaving uh, party en masse. And before the uprising, about 40% uh, of the members of the Kronstadt Party organization left. In the course of uprising itself, only one third of Kronstadt communists came out against uh, the rebels. And uh, the Provisional uh, Communist Party Bureau was created. And this Provisional Communist Party Bureau called for cooperation with the revolutionary committee created by uh, rebels. And then the members, communist members of this Provisional uh, Bureau were shot by Cheka. And among leaders of the Kronstadt rebellion, uh, many were former communists, including Petrichenko and some, some others. Uh, they understood their struggle as a struggle for slogans of October 1917, slogans that were proclaimed by Bolsheviks but not realized in practice. And later, Rafael Abramovich, the Menshevik leader in exile, wrote that uh, Kronstadt events were an uprising against Bolshevik dictatorship by a part of Bolshevism itself. And had the Kronstadt uprising of 1921 any chances to win? Here, I think we can uh, remind uh, the similar situation, which happened two and a half years before in Germany, in German uh, Baltic port of Kiel, where the sailors uprising in November 1918 sparked the uh, successful democratic revolution, November revolution in Germany. So uh, I think that in this revolutionary situation, this uprising, had some potential for changing the political situation. And uh, many soldiers uh, refused to fight uh, Kronstadt rebels. Uh, I, we can, uh, if, if it's interesting, I can give you a concrete examples, very interesting examples uh, of this disobedience in Red Army and solidarity with the <coughs> Kronstadt rebels. Uh, and um, so it was very difficult to uh, prevent spreading the uprising out of Kronstadt. And if uh, the ice melts, uh, and uh, this was a spring and ice, uh, ice was expected to melt soon, the Kronstadt could uh, be an impregnable fortress. fortress. 
and the linking together Baltic fleet sailors, striking workers and peasants, uh, peasant insurgents could have a potential to change or transform political re regime in Russia. And their victory <coughs> could um, transform the country political system, uh, granting uh, peasants uh, full freedom in action in regard to their land, as uh, Kronstadt rebels demand, uh, to create a democratic political system. That would have meant resolution of both main questions of the great Russian revolution, agrarian question, and political question. But not every revolutionary situation develops into a revolution and the Kronstadt uprising of 1921 was defeated. Several factors contributed into this outcome. Spontaneous character of rebellion uh, without any organizational preparations, mostly defensive tactics of rebels who for too long time believed in a compromise with communist party leaders. And at the same time, Political forces that could have supported rebellion in Petrograd were neutralized by preemptive arrests and by Necheka. However, Kronstadt uprising, though defeated, played an important role by forcing Bolsheviks, together with other popular uprisings and protests, to put an end to the hated war communism policy and introduce the new economic policy, NEP. Concessions to peasants, including the new Agrarian Code of 1922, losing of state grip over economy, what Lenin called the self termidization of Bolsheviks, improved situation in the country and led to the decline of mass protest activity. After uh, Kronstadt, Great Russian Revolution entered its final downward phase. Uh, last centers of peasant insurgencies were suppressed scale of workers' struggles diminished, thus the Great Revolution come to an end with, with only partial resolution of its objective tasks. Social achievements of peasant majority of the Russian population had not political guarantees. Simultaneously, with certain economic liberalization, a political regime of Communist Party dictatorship hardened Communist leaders were threatened by what they call the spirit of Kronstadt, which they feared could lead to new uprisings. Therefore, they made decisions to finally purge Soviets of very few remaining non-communist oppositions and decision to outlaw opposition factions inside the ruling party itself. This contradictory outcome of the Great Russian Revolution laid basis for new contradictions and crises that had to expose themselves in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexei. And thank you to all of our speakers for four really fascinating talks. So we'll cross over to questions now, which one of our colleagues is helpfully um, cross bringing over from Twitch to us in the Zoom call. So if you've got any more questions, please do put, pop them in the chat and we'll pass them on to our speakers. So uh, an opening question, I, I think this one is for Simon. Um, so you mentioned that you were once part of a Trotskyist group. Um, so our uh, question um, is, what do the Trotskyists have to say about the Kronstadt Rebellion? Um, the audience member is guessing that they might have been opposed to it since Trotsky himself was leading the army against it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, we had a uh, discussion group meeting with uh, friends here in London. We have a small discussion group of uh, those of us who think of ourselves as communists. And we talked about Kronstadt. And uh, so one of those who'd been a Trotskyist told of how he had, uh, without knowing really any of the details, had stubbornly defended the Bolshevik action uh, at Kronstadt um, when he was challenged by uh, anarchists in his university and so on. I have to say that in my own time in the Trotskyist movement, I, I knew very little. I'm sure that uh, had I been challenged in that way, uh, I would have reacted the same way uh, that my comrade did. So this was in the 1970s and 80s. And in fact, one of our friends in London, uh, who'd been uh, uh, in an anarchist group in the 80s, told of how he would delight of going to demonstrations and finding Trotskyists and challenging them 
about Kronstadt. And of course, he'd actually read something about Kronstadt, that some of the books that have been mentioned on this call. And he had information, which a lot of those uh, Trotskyist militants uh, hadn't bothered to uh, read up on. Um, I think, but uh, so that's about our own experience. I think the other thing to say is about Trotsky's own uh, position, um, which he maintained stubbornly to the end of his life, uh, that uh, the Bolsheviks had had no choice. And I, I tried to refer to this, that this idea that, you know, the, this authoritarian uh, action in the revolution was somehow inevitable or, or justifiable. And I think that did have a very damaging and very, um, uh, you know, that was very long life to that one. And uh, I'd strongly recommend to people to read this, uh, in some ways, tragic correspondence between Serge and Trotsky at the end of his life. There's a there's a book in English called the Serge Trotsky Papers or something. And it just shows how, I mean, first of all, there's quite a lot of evidence that the Stalinist secret police were winding people up against each other. These people were living in uh, emigration. Their relatives had in some cases been killed. There was a lot of repression going on. Um, but, you know, Trotsky is, abs you know, Serge says to Trotsky, look, are you really saying that the day that we gave the Cheka the power to kill people without any trial was really such a great day? And Trotsky just doesn't answer these kind of questions. And uh, so I think that together with, with Serge, uh, who, who sort of speaks about how he had a heavy heart and, and went along with Zinoviev and these people who refused to negotiate with the uh, leaders of the uprising. And, and Serge uh, explains how he was there and representing the Communist International and how he went along with this, the, you know, with a heavy heart, with this decision to break off these uh, negotiations. But, but later on, he, he writes about uh, this libertarian moment in all revolutions, that, uh, th th this libert that revolutions are not a really great place for this libertarian spirit. And that, that's why we have to redouble our struggle for that libertarian spirit. And I think his, his way of looking at it is, is something we can uh, take something from. Thank you. So I've got a question next, which I think anyone might might respond to if they would like to. Um, how do the events and the histories that you've discussed today tie into um, the uh, current day Russian and other post-Soviet anarchist movements? Are there links that we could draw out here? Um, is there anyone who'd like to speak to that um, speak to that question? No, uh, Lara, I can of <clears throat> not about uh, anarchist movements, uh, contemporary anarchist movement, but uh, about the contemporary views of um, Kronstadt uprising. Uh, you know that uh, <clears throat> Boris Yeltsin, the former president, was very, very long time ago that we had another president, Boris Yeltsin, and he uh, promised to establish uh, a monument uh, for um, Kronstadt rebels. And it was, this uh, promise was made in early 90s. Now it's uh, 2021, no monuments was erected. We have monuments for Kolchak, uh, still monuments for Bolshevik leaders and so on, and uh, not uh, this one. Uh, and you see that um, the official narrative of uh, uh, <clears throat> approach to this uh, events of revolution or the civil war, that, that it was a war between reds and whites. And that's all, no third force, only Lenin or Denikin. And Kronstadt uprising doesn't fit into, fit into this narrative. And it's funny that uh, there was a publication not long ago on one of the big uh, popular historical websites about Kronstadt. And it called Kronstadt rebels whites. You see, it's uh, because because the, uh, this leading narrative that does not uh, imply that there could be any other <laughs> third force. And um, the, the, uh, he, the task of historians uh, now is to uh, prove that there was a third force, not only Kronstadt. Uh, green movement, anarchist movement, uh, oppositional movement, and so on and so forth. And uh, this uh, this task is still to be realized in Russian historiography and in uh, Russian public opinion. 
Thanks very much, Alexi. Does anyone else want to say anything on that question? Yes, go ahead, Dimitri. Um, to continue on uh, uh, with uh, about the monuments, uh, it was correctly noticed in the chat that uh, there was a, there is a memorial to those who died uh, in the events. Most of them are uh, the the, the communist on the communist side, but uh, the rebels have managed to carry out uh, one funeral of uh, their own uh, on their own side who were killed. Uh, just before the city was stormed, uh, the city of Kronstadt was stormed. But um, as uh, Alexei Viktorovich uh, had noted, uh, there was a pledge by uh, uh, Yeltsin to elect a monument to the rebels. Uh, the, a few days ago, I think five or something on Monday, um, uh, the Russian Historical uh, Military History Society, they have uh, installed a new plaque in the downtown Kronstadt. And they're pledging to um, uh, build a monument there. And uh, this uh, uh, this is an official, uh, a rather conservative organization. So they're probably going to present. I don't have good feelings about it. Uh, they're probably going to present it as a uh, very much an anti-communist, uh, white uh, sort of led uprising. And uh, there, there, there was also a smaller one uh, erected just a couple of days ago on the, the Reef Fort, which is on the far far western side of uh, uh, Kronstadt, which I've uh, had uh, as one of my slides. And uh, I think it's much nicer, but uh, it would be a lot harder for tourists to get to. Thank you. Dimitri, I believe we have another question for you next. So um, we have an audience member who'd like to know a bit more about the coalition that nearly gained a majority in 1920. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Did I speak about 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 it? Uh, I, th I think it was uh, Simon's. Uh, is, it, is that in Simon's talk? Sorry about that. There, I muddled up my my typing. <laughs> I, I think uh, what, maybe what the question is about is I mentioned there was a coalition of uh, opposition groups in the Moscow Bolshevik Party. So this is within the Bolshevik Party, and there's this huge um, discussion going on about the so-called Verkhny Nizhny, so the the tops and the and the ranks. And basically the ranks are saying that, you know, the tops need to listen to them. And a lot of the same issues about equalization of rations and so on that are uh, being raised by the wider workers movement are raised within the party. There's not a strong uh, line, even from the ranks really about the political issues with, with some exceptions, but uh, there was a coalition of these groups. There was a big group in the Bauman district, um, which uh, w was, close to the workers' opposition, but not part of it. Uh, there was another group led by Guy Yefim Ignatov, which was a separate group, uh, which was strong in Moscow. And these groups got together with the Democratic Centralists and the workers' opposition. And at the conference of the party in, in November 1920, um, uh, the Moscow regional uh, conference of the Bolshevik party, um, th there was a vote, I can't remember, on some kind of crucial question, I think, what... Uh, you know, a, a, a main strategy to adopt. And then the oppositions collectively came within a whisker, you know, out of 500 or something votes, they were three or four votes behind the official um, position. And uh, that just shows the extent to which this tumult within the working class, I think, is reflected inside uh, the party. And after um, 1921, uh, the events that we're talking about, two groups in particular came out of the party, the Workers uh, the workers and Peasants Socialist Party, which was led by Guy Vasily Panyushkin, uh, who'd also been in the Navy, I think, at one point uh, in 1917. Um, and then another group, a very interesting group called the Workers Group. And it's the only group I came across in my research where the leaders were women communists, women communists who'd fought at the front uh, during the Civil War. Um, and they said that the country was now being ruled by a scientific uh, technical intelligentsia and that uh, instead of talking, of, instead of pretending, communists, instead of pretending that this was some kind of socialism, should face the fact that it was some sort of bureaucratic dictatorship and go on from there. And uh, some of the members of that group, or some of the members of both of those groups, uh, ended up in Siberia uh, for talking about these things. Thank you, Simon. So another big question, potentially all of our panellists may want to have something to say here. Um, do you think there was a way that Kronstadt could have existed longer? 
Um, or were the Bolsheviks too powerful um, for this uh, to have continued? Um, what, what thoughts do you have? Uh, Constantine? Okay, uh, it's uh, really hard to speak in this way uh, about everything. Uh, we could say that potentially the, uh, like uh, in a war way, maybe it could. Yeah, it was saying about the uh, melting ice and uh, Kronstadt was really powerful fort uh, even after uh, some years of uh, uh, civil war. Uh, but in the same time, we have to think uh, politically and uh, uh, about the food, for example. Yeah, it's not really simple to get it uh, during that time. And uh, that's uh, the tricky question in this way. So uh, the idea maybe of a crunch that the uh, idea of uh, uh, like a best revolutionaries during the 1970s uh, also could be a good advertising for uh, uh, those people. Yeah, so. Maybe it could be the same thing if they make uh, some delegates to the whole the country to stick with them and so. Yeah, but uh, during that time it was not a provisional government which was not so strong. Yeah, in 1970, the Bolshevik Party even we could say it was not really powerful in the uh, Petrograd during 1921. It was stronger than provisional government that way, and uh, it got lots of uh, ways to attack the Grandstadt in the like in the, in the war way, yeah, not only in the political way. Yeah, so they got uh, they were strong enough to, to do it uh, if we compare it to the provisional government way, which is uh, get the more or less the same situation with the uh, Grandstadt in the 1970s. Does anyone else want to come back on this question as well? Um, perhaps it might be worth uh, comparing to another uprising which happened roughly at the same, well, in a few months' time uh, in roughly the same area. Um, uh, the Karelian uprising, the, the so called Karelska Aventura, Karelian Adventure, is adventure which was kind of clandestinely supported by uh, some elements of the Finnish government, uh, which did gain uh, quite a bit of territory, but it was crushed uh, really quickly, although it had uh, a bit of support from the local peasants, uh, because, you know, the Soviet army was very strong by that time. But uh, th there are other cases uh, just there, like Estonia, which had uh, managed to gain, uh, win independence and uh, which uh, carried out a uh, land reform which gave it uh, a, a, a lot of popularity to the new Estonian state. Uh, and uh, uh, that was uh, also an another way uh, of uh, looking at things. We never know, but uh, I think uh, as uh, Konstantin being, uh, is being a military expert here, uh, he probably has a uh, better idea of what was going on. Thank you. Go ahead, Alex. <clears throat> I think that uh, if uh, Kronstadt uh, continue to exist as a uh, territory of the third revolution, uh, it could uh, be a point of consolidation of uh, political, various political forces uh, which fought uh, communist rule at, uh, at this because, uh, as I mentioned, there was a huge peasant movement at that time. Only in Tambov region, the uh, peasant army of Alexander Antonov operated, 50,000 fighters. In West Siberia, 100,000 fighters. Uh, and uh, it's only to name uh, the most important uh, in certain detachments. And uh, uh, the problem with food was, uh, I think, uh, not, so, not so terrible because uh, there was Finland near and they could uh, <clears throat> receive food from there. And uh, uh, a Russian immigration uh, suggested them to do that. And uh, they at first refused the cooperation with, uh, for example, socialist revolutionary immigration. But uh, I think that this was rational for them to accept 
the, for, for instance, food supply from uh, <clears throat> other countries with support of Russian immigration. And uh, uh, if, if uh, the ice melts, so as I, also, as I said, the cross that uh, it was impossible to take it. And uh, this could change situation in very radical way. And also we must take into account the attitude of Red Army soldiers and the Red Army sailors. Uh, you, we know that there were two assaults of Kronstadt. One, the first assault was in the day of opening of the 10th Communist Party Congress on the March 8th of the 1921. And this assault for, failed because mainly because Red Army soldiers didn't want to fight. And uh, it was reported that some of them uh, stopped when they saw the red flags over Kronstadt. And they said, oh, what is it? We were told that Kronstadt is in the hand of the white contra-revolutionaries, white generals. But now we see red flags there. So we are cheated by our commissar. So we stop, we don't go there. And Cheka had to create extraordinary troikas, uh, uh, courts of three people. And these courts, they shot more than 100 uh, Red Army soldiers in two days in order to frighten them and to send them against Kronstadt. So it was very, very serious crisis in security apparatus and if uh, apparatus of communists. And if Kronstadt continue, this crisis could have aggravated more and more. Thank you very much. I think you've perhaps answered our next question um, about potentially Bolsheviks supporting the movement and, and some of the, the interesting stories you referred to in your talk of um, of uh, Red Army soldiers refusing to uh, to fight the uh, against the Kronstadt uprising. So I wonder whether we might ask this question instead to uh, Constantine and um, to ask about um, the ideological um, exchanges and the political flexibility and diversity of Kronstadt um, in 1917. Um, and whether that can tell us anything about the, the political life and culture um, there, you know, leading up to 1921. Uh, thank you. Uh, as I understand this question, the main thing it's about the uh, political parties, political movements in the 1917, uh, which is uh, much more I know. Um, you know, it's, it's really interesting that one of the most important crises uh, during the 1917 connected to the Kronstadt was the uh, 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 July days. Yeah, so big uprising in the Petrograd against provisional government, which uh, Kronstadt sailors joined with the uh, 500 people with the weapons and so on. So after that, uh, some of the uh, sailors were arrested and the provisional government said to uh, Kronstadt Soviet, that they want to uh, find uh, the people who organized this, um, um, this uprising against provisional government in the Kronstadt. And the uh, 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 Kronstadt Soviet refused to, uh, uh, to organize this uh, investigation in the Kronstadt. And what is uh, most interesting, all the parties of the provision uh, of the um, Kronstadt Soviet uh, agreed not to allow a provisional government to work on the Kronstadt. So even uh, there was uh, a uh, like struggle between uh, Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, which we know of in the 1917. Uh, so uh, it was uh, uh, like a big block during the uh, July and August when provisional government wanted to organize this investigation. So uh, even they were uh, like politically uh, uh, parties which were against each other. Yeah, they cooperate when it was uh, like a big crisis during that time. So it's really interesting that uh, all the socialists in the Kronstadt Soviet agreed in, uh, in this period. Even uh, when it was October, uh, uh, upheaval, yeah, which uh, also Kronstadt supported. Uh, some of the Mensheviks, which were not agreed to join the, uh, this movement, yeah, they did nothing uh, uh, to stop uh, the sailors. Yeah, so 
uh, it's it's really interesting because uh, cooperation in a such way could be really a good al- alternative after the October Revolution. Yeah, we know that there was a big negotiations between uh, SRS, Mensheviks and Bolsheviks to organize the uh, new uh, government, uh, socialist government. And it was existed in a Kronstadt in this way. Yeah, so after July days, we could see it's, it's uh, like whole the socialist front were together against the provisional government in the Kronstadt. So if I answer the question. Thanks very much. So a very final question uh, before we close this panel. Um, so again, I think a question that um, several of our speakers may wish to address. Um, so to what extent was Kronstadt stand for democracy, a break um, with or continuity with uh, Bolshevism, so more in ideological terms, as opposed to the party as a more of an institution is the way I think um, I understand this question. Is there anyone who would like to speak to that question? Oh, go ahead, Simon. Well, just I think what, what it, a way of thinking about this is really um, the way that Alexei laid it out as one big process starting from March 1917 and going right through and uh, I, I, I'm not, no, there's no need to get into it here. I mean, I, I, I'm slightly less, um, I'm slightly less optimistic is perhaps the word about what would have been the possibilities for things to go particularly differently. Um, uh, yes, okay, about the ice melting and all the rest. I think the overall circumstances were really very difficult for the revolution. And in fact, what happens is that the Bolsheviks make this retreat on the economic issues, and uh, it, it, that's tragic because then what happens through the what these people who left the, the Communist Party at that point were going for was look, you know, we've got to recognise there's going to be a class struggle, and then the working class should organise itself to pursue that struggle through the 1920s, and that stance was absolutely rejected by the Bolshevik Party, who wanted to do things really in a top-down uh, way. But I think what, what, where I completely uh, agree with Alexei's laying it out, this is one big process. And th- it's important to contrast uh, the situation in 1921 with this torrent of democracy in 1917, which Constantine's described and which was going on everywhere. Um, there's real democracy and real participatory um, uh, cooperative bodies being set up, not only Soviets, but factory committees and all the rest of it. And uh, that, you know, what didn't happen was that, that that revived after the Civil War at Kronstadt and, and in many, many other places. Um, but the state bureaucracy controlled by the Bolsheviks is already working in the opposite uh, direction. Thank you, Sam. Does anyone else want to respond? Perhaps Alexei. Uh, um, the question of continuity between the uh, Kronstadt uprising of 1921 and Bolshevism of 1917. It's an interesting question because when uh, in, the, in the late 1930s there was a discussion uh, among socialists, anarchists, communists about Kronstadt, uh, uh, Trotsky wrote article A Hue and Cry over Kronstadt. And the, there he uh, put forward an argument that the Kronstadt of 1921 is completely different from Kronstadt of 1917. Uh, in 1921, there were um, new sailors who were mobilized from um, village uh, yesterday and uh, kulaks and so on. And all this uh, glory and pride of the Russian Revolution of 1917 disappeared. They were killed on front of civil war. Uh, and this is, of course, not so much true. Because um, uh, the uh, um, rebellion started uh, in the battleship Sevastopol and Petropavlovsk. And as far as I know, maybe colleagues have other information. Sevastopol and Petropavlovsk uh, had crews which uh, did not change a lot from 1917. It was the old sailors who participated in events of 1917. And they were vanguard of the Kronstadt <clears throat> rebellion. And uh, I think that many of them, most of them probably, in October 1917, were supporters of Bolsheviks. And then they grew disillusioned and all that. 
And another uh, force in 1921 were really new recruits from mainly south of Russia and Ukraine. And uh, the rebellion was a synthesis of two uh, parts, these old veterans of revolution and the new mostly peasant origin recruits, which transmitted the attitudes and ideas of this growing popular discontent with Bolshevik. And this uh, synthesis, I think, had a big potential. Thank you. And thank you to all. Oh, go ahead, Dimitri. Her final Uh, response to the question. Go go on. um, I think as far as, uh, you know, um, our understanding of democracy is concerned, it was very different, uh, differently understood uh, in 1917 than it is now, uh, because, you know, democracy was often understood as just the working people and uh, uh, the power of the working people was to be a democracy and uh, it was uh, rather different from uh, the refined uh, political ideas uh, uh, that, uh, you know, w- w- the, the, the well-read bookish types uh, would be aware of and which informed uh, the provisional government's uh, moves. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a well-known and uh, well-discussed uh, uh, problem. Uh, I think uh, one of uh, Boris Kalanitsky's articles on this matter has been translated into English. Uh, so uh, people willing to uh, find out what uh, was understood as democracy in 1917 uh, can uh, try and uh, search that out. And uh, obviously much of what was understood as democracy in 1917 was also, uh, has also informed the experience of uh, uh, 1921. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to all of our speakers. Thank you very much to the Organising Collective to, for putting together this panel. It's been really fascinating to hear from all of our four speakers today. I hope that you found it interesting that, that we've answered your questions.